when COVID-19 hit us in the spring of 2020. The pandemic sent the world reeling. Forcing us to shut down economies. Forcing us to recalibrate our normal. Forcing us to confront the what's next. What's next for jobs. For education. For families. And our health and well-being. This podcast ponders how we will live in this COVID era. What's on the horizon? What should we expect? Where are the opportunities? We explore the what's next in the next next normal. normal. Well, hello, I'm Aaron Trafford. I'm Dave Trafford. And we are into episode two of The Next Normal. And today we're talking about, we're pulling that thread. We are going into the workplace, which I think, can we say that on the surface, it feels like COVID had the biggest impact on the workplace, maybe second only to healthcare? Well, even that qualifies in the health in the workplace setting, right? right. It just is the, the way we have uh, delivered healthcare, the way we have reorganized healthcare, is extreme in some cases, but it did really reflect the whole focus on the future of work, how we are going to deliver uh, productivity in the workplace, and those are really big issues that you know we talked in the last episode about meaning. I mean, think about how the meaning of work has changed to, uh, you know, Ujwal Arkolgood. He is our cultural anthropologist on on the show. And it, just to think about how the meaning of work has changed, not just the future of work. So I think you're right because it affected everything. Look at, at your house, right? You, Dan, working from home, the kids are in the mm-hmm. house, the, the pets are in the house. <laughs> All of a sudden, that's a completely different definition of work and workspace. And what it means to be productive and what it means to use your time, which I think is also sort of the underlying themes that we're going to get into in this episode today. I mean, when you go from being in a dynamic office environment to all of a sudden having no separation between your breakfast table and your desk and your children's play space, that is going to cause all of these questions to bubble up about what does it mean to do work? Where do I do work? How do I do work and how are we going to move forward? So that's what we're going to dig into in today's conversation with our hosts and uh, kicking things off with Lisa Taylor. Yeah, Lisa's at uh, Challenge Factor. Her expertise and her firm actually deals with the future of work. And, you know, Mm -hmm. we we just got into small minutia. For example, what what is it going to be like just to navigate trying to get onto an elevator and how much that has changed? And not surprising, Lisa's already thought about it. One of the things that we've seen a lot uh, over the last number of weeks even, as companies have shifted and started to really focus on their reopening strategies and uh, reimagining strategies, is what does it actually mean and what is it going to take for things not to be one size fits all? Uh, it used to be that it was recognized not the entire employee base you know, was a, a monolith and you had to have different flavors, but now the number of different flavors and the, the amount of accommodations and needs and conflicting needs is actually at an extreme point. And so how do um, employers make some sense of this for two reasons? First, because we have to. Uh, we will be returning back to having relationships that are not based on everyone sitting in their uh, makeshift offices at home. We will resume business relationships as we had in the past, and we need to be able to migrate there into what those relationships will look like. And second, from a practical perspective, even individual employees don't want the options to be endless. They want to know what's the framework, what's the way that we're going to do this. We hear it over and over again to our politicians, but also to our employers. What's the plan? And so that ability to kind of say, okay, it's not one size fits all, but here are the variations of sizes and here's how we're going to plan and here's how you raise issues when you have them with a really renewed sense that it's okay to actually have a new need. Um, I think we've developed an enormous amount of that type of managerial muscle. I want to jump in here because I think what you're saying is so important and we need to acknowledge where um, the experience that employees have gone through in the last year. 
in this tremendous period of uncertainty. Now we're asking people from a behavioral perspective to make decisions about the risks, the benefits, and the trade-offs of going back to work, whatever that means, whether it's a hybrid work uh, experience, whether it's going back, commuting, going back to an office, um, going back to what they were doing previously. And I think that your point about the need for a plan, but certainly for the employers to have a plan, but also for the employees to have a plan, some context that will help them make decisions. Because the endless uncertainty has been really, really hard on people. And if we if we knew the context in which we were making decisions, I think people would feel more comfortable and more confident about making those decisions. Yeah, I really like that. And you know, one of the um, faculty members at York, a philosopher, really nailed it uh, around this time last year in 2020, where she expressed that the reason why every decision we go to make is so difficult is because it's laden with moral hazard. We can't Mm -hmm. actually judge what's good and bad. And Mm -hmm. the way that we used to make those decisions is kind of all up in the air. So we've kind of come to terms with that a little bit in our personal lives. We still struggle to make decisions, but it's not so angst ridden about, you know, how will I get groceries? Should I go or should I order? We've kind of sorted through some of those first level decisions that we need to make over the last number of months. But work is a whole new story. Uh, You know, how do you integrate uh, employees that have made the decision to vaccinate or not vaccinate? How do you integrate different types of workers so that there's equity in who gets to return to an office or who doesn't have to return to an office? There's lots of ways where we're about to embark on a period where in the work world, we're also experiencing a little bit of this moral hazard. We're not sure the actual implications Mm -hmm. of decisions in one way or another. And that's where leaders need different types of tools to try to navigate. They can't just take a straight line strategic planning approach. We've got to come up with different ways of asking different questions that help us to create something that actually works for all and for the business. I mean, at the end of the day, employers exist for a reason. We need to be able to sustain whether it's the mission and goals of the organization or the needs of the business. And that also needs to be factored in. So we're in this uh, interesting scenario in the midst of all of this, Lisa, because our business has never had an office space for six years. And we found it took us a good four years to figure out what our culture was going to be, because the hardest part was uh, resolving conflict because we weren't seeing each other. We weren't going out for coffees together, getting lunch, sorting out tough situations. Instead, we would have the tough situation on a Zoom call and that would be the end of it. (laughs) And this is just one example among so many, but it took us a good four, five years. We're still figuring it out. But but the benefit for us is that, uh, you know, half of our employee base has been with us since pretty much day one. And now they've settled into a culture that the other half is slowly learning. But one of the questions I guess I have for you uh, also is, you know, what, there's so much talk about all the new things, all the supposedly positive things that will come out of working from home, more flexible hours, time with our children, blah, blah, blah. There's not a lot of talk about all the challenges that we're going to have to deal with. For example, and this is, uh, this is a negative example, but still important. How do you judge harassment in the workplace? Whatever kind of harassment that would be. You need new policies. You need the legal framework to understand that. I'm just curious to to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think you're right. And they are really important topics. And we have seen a rise in different types of complaints and how things actually happen when the inappropriate behavior, for example, happens online as opposed to in person. And you don't have other allies around you or other people that are kind of also observing the same thing. And you're isolated. I mean, one of the things that we know is a significant issue is, is isolation and workers from home unless there's really specific ways that the employer is acting are are isolated in most of the most Mm -hmm. circumstances so i think that it it certainly does raise a whole bunch of policy related issues i think if we just default to thinking about it though as a policy problem and you know so what's Mm -hmm. the new guideline what's the new rule uh, we'll miss the opportunity to actually shape what we want workforces to be like because it's not a It's not a legislative requirement that we need to be focusing on. We need to be focusing on, well, what do we want? 
there's lots of things that are possible. Uh, we can do things in all kinds of different ways, but as the employee, as the frontline manager who's on the crux of the really pointy end issues, as the executive, like what do we actually want for this world of work? And what do we want it to look like you know, when our children and our grandchildren are going to work, what will work look like then? Sometimes it's much easier for us to actually be able to articulate what we want now if we think about it by saying, if we're successful in evolving the world of work, what does it look like for our grandchildren? Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear what all of you have to say about that. What do you think our grandchildren should, should have as their workplace environment? Well, Dave Hardy, the whole idea is that we get into a situation where you are it, professionally, you're doing exactly what Lisa is suggesting we all need to do, because the planning that you do is generational. So as you hear this conversation unfold, how does this inform now a, a new view or a new approach to, to, to urban planning? Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> we've had it significantly rethink, um, you know, planners think in 25 and 40 year chunks. Um, and, and if you've been a planner as long as I have, you know, what you planned when you're in your 20s, you can actually see it happening right now. It's uh, a bit boring, but <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> we, we kind of think accountants are pretty exciting people. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking like, what does a house, a new house look like um, where there's homework? Do you build in a small school space? Do you? Do you build in a specific workspace to a new house? Do you have, along with your thermometer or your, your thermostat on your wall, do you have a virus monitor on your wall too? Mm. Uh, that's technology that's around today, but there's no standards for that. We don't require that. I'm also, uh, as a planner, I also look at, try to look at the full demographics and full um, characterization of work. There are a lot of uh, professions and jobs that have never stopped working. They've, mm -hmm. they've had to adapt. Uh, I'm thinking skilled laborers, bankers, retail, service sector. They haven't. They don't work from home. But it's interesting. We have a lot to learn. I think from them. I, I know the the skilled trades that the plumbers won't work at the same time as the electricians, the same time as the carpenters. So the way they keep clusters together, health clusters, is they work at different points, and that's all new and it's negotiated. We see retail and service. They, they've built these um, containment units kind of around them, a, a Lexan sort of glass, but um, they've upped the sanitation and that's how they do their work. So they're not working from home, but do we have more to learn from what we're seeing from all the other occupations out there? I think a big challenge that I'd like to just um, throw out there is that people like Dave and Lisa are looking far out to work in the future, communities in the future, urban settings in the future. But I think where a lot of people are right now, um, employees, is trying to figure out how we're going to get through the fall. <laughs> I, they're not mm -hmm. looking at uh, a 5, 10, or 20 year horizon. They're looking at how are we going to get through September to December. Yeah, what are we, are we gonna have gonna... Christmas dinner together, right? I mean, yeah, are we gonna, yeah. Ha what are we going to, how are we gonna make the adjustments we need to make? And I think that we need to be, I think we need to acknowledge and validate those, um, The that all the little mini decisions that people are gonna have to make, some of them will be more major decisions, but how are we gonna navigate the next few months and do it in a way that we feel confident and comfortable and safe. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we're very concerned about from a public health point of view is flu season coming up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like we can't just sort of say, well, geez, let's get through the summer. And if we could just get everybody vaccinated, um, you know, we can put this thing behind us and go back to where we were. It's, we can't. And I think that navigating all of the things that are coming up in the next few months means that, you know, Lisa, in your world, the world of work is going to have to be constantly acknowledging that we're, we're taking little baby steps on this path. We can't just 
go from where we're at today to the next place. I was quite stunned. Yesterday, I actually heard three CEOs, two in the States and one in Canada, um, say that they expected to have all their employees back in the office um, by September 1st. And I just, I just went, oh, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we need to do both. And I think what happens in so many of the conversations about the future and the future of work is we default to either having a discussion about reopening and the immediate steps that have to happen, the next, let's say, you know, zero to six months and what's going to unfold, or we end up very far into the future and talking back the way that we used to before the pandemic of robots taking everyone's jobs and what's gonna happen. And I think that we need to have both conversations at the same time. And I think we have the capacity to do it. I think most conversations really underestimate our ability to manage both short-term and long-term implications at the same time and don't encourage executives to be expressive about that as much as uh, as we need them to be. So for example, I don't think there is anything about the last 15 months and even going into the future for the next six to 12 months that should be held up as the example or the experiment that is then going to give us a guide in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're navigating a crisis. In the middle of a crisis, you don't start to do a whole bunch of other uncontrolled experiments and then use that as if it's been running in normal times and that's what you can make decisions on. And so I think we need to be able to give our leaders and our staff permission to say, we're going to figure this out as we go. Mm -hmm. We're going to be as predictable as we can to reduce that moral hazard that we were talking about a couple of minutes ago but we're gonna get some things right and some things wrong. And here's the way we're gonna to navigate together in the short term. And then in the long term, let's start using some of the things that have come out of the pandemic, the relationship between work and life, parenting and working, health and work, social justice and relationships in the workplace. Like, let's take a look at all of these things that are not gonna be solved in the next six weeks and let's make sure that the decisions that we are starting to emerge with reflect the kinds of things that we want to see over the long term. And let's do both. Let's not say we can only think about the short term or only think about the long term. Let's make sure we're doing both at the same time. So one thing before we, we had a few minutes here and I just want to uh, pick your brain on this then Ushwal. We've talked a lot about the culture. We've talked a whole lot about how we have redefined and changed our perspective on uh, the, the workplace uh, such as it is given our COVID experience. What we haven't touched on is the whole question around productivity and you, mm -hmm. you being the meaning expert. I'm curious to know, you know how you have seen that shift uh, and be reinvented or redefined. It's funny, I have a conversation coming up on a, on a, a podcast with a, a senior vice president at Target uh, in a couple of weeks, and we're talking about the future of work, and we're studying you know, changing meaning around work. And one of the areas is productivity and how people think about it. Uh, and certainly, it's the one time where the shift away from hours spent to how fulfilling the tasks have been that's an incredible transformation. It's still, I mean, I'm making it sound bigger than it is. Again, the, the shift is still smaller than we all think it is. It's still a small percentage of the workforce that has changed what productivity really means to them in their minds. But even if it's a small percentage, it's significant enough that it's actually impacting work environments. One example. I was recently reading an article that talked about how 2020 was uh, a record year in the US for people considering a switch in career or mm. for people walking into, well, walking into, virtually walking into their manager's office and saying, I'm not satisfied with the tasks I do in my job. That's fascinating to me. And I think that's, that's a result of some of these changing meanings. Mm -hmm. I, I um, just want to pick up on yeah, that and just say that we are only going to see that continuing to accelerate. Mm -hmm. So certainly as a, you know, as the 
the head of a firm that's focused in the area of career development, all of the career related implications over the last, uh, you know, over the pandemic period has been fascinating to be a part of and to watch. As things start to move and open up though, Sarah, to your point, how are we gonna navigate the next couple of weeks and the next couple of months? People who have been going full out and are tired are now gonna to start to activate on some of those choices that they were thinking about, about maybe mm -hmm. they want to make a change. And voluntary turnover is going to increase as people start to realize the crisis is over, my team is good, I've done what I need to do, and now it actually is time for me to move on. Uh, so the amount of voluntary turnover and reflection of what does my work mean for me and how will I make different choices when things start to resume more of normality mm -hmm. is an enormous managerial challenge that we're going to see through the summer and definitely into early 2022. Let me just add one thing yep. to that, Dave, because I think it's interesting. I would just say, watch the women. I've had this conversation with um, at least four women in the past two weeks who have decided that they've done what they needed to do. They are going to step back. They are going to refocus. Ujwal, to your point, they're thinking about their values and what's really important to them at this point in their life. And they're gonna be reflecting on that over the summer. All right, I know, don't go anywhere. I know you wanted to continue the conversation and so did our hosts. But we want to let this breathe. And I think, Aaron, at this, I'd be really curious to see. There was so much in there, as we said off the top, the way COVID has affected the future of work. We got like a four-dimensional view now, I think, of where the plan is moving forward. And I think for me, what I took away from this episode was just the number of questions we now are being called to answer that we didn't realize were questions before. I mean, just even the conversation around moral hazard and that we don't have frameworks necessarily for how to identify or deal with things like harassment in an online workplace, um, how to manage you know, the concept of wellness and fulfillment when you can't actually sit in a room and read somebody's actual body language. I mean, there's there are so many questions that we now have that 18 months ago never really occurred to us. Yeah, and I think that the next step in all of this uh, is, as we suggested, that we're going to have to start to look at not just the environment, the boardroom, the, the boardroom table, the kitchen table, I think is the way it went, it was the idea that how does this now affect the way we plan our city? So we're going from this right in front of us moment to trying to deal with the future of work to how do we create city and an urban environment that not only accommodates that future of work but encourages it and accelerates some of the great opportunities there so i'm um, kind of looking forward to hearing what dave hardy has to say about that yeah me too and i i think that those are the the hopeful questions that we can start to to tease out and the imagine if we had cities and houses that were built to accommodate different kinds of working and lifestyle environments. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to see what Dave has to say. The Next Normal is sponsored by Challenge Factory, shaping the future of work. By Decision Partners. Our world is a better place when we make better decisions. By Motive Base, decoding implicit meaning behind what people talk about. And by Hardy Stevenson and Associates, planning the cities of the future. Comments, questions, or ideas for our hosts? Feel free to drop us an email at hello at storystudionetwork.com. This series is produced for the Story Studio Network by Eye Contact Productions.